bring you up to date with where we're at with the project that we started a couple of years ago. Now, I'm conscious that several people here will not be um, aware of what we, we started at that point, so I'm just going to bring you a, a very quick recap uh, of where we're at. The site that we're looking at uh, lies here in uh, eastern Dumfrieshire or, or in southwest borders, if you want to see it that way. Um, but it very much is a, a borders uh, project in the borders area. Um, and you can see this is the M74 here. Um, so it lies, the site lies very close uh, to uh, the, uh, it lies between Ecclefechan and Lockerbie. Uh, the site itself consists of a 17 acre Iron Age hill fort here, Burnswark Hill, and it's straddled by two Roman camps, one on the south side, um, which is about 10 acres, and one about five or six acres on the north side. Now, uh, on the face of it, it looks quite straightforward. It looks like the Romans have decided to uh, besiege the, the hilltop. Um, and that's how it was interpreted right up to the 1960s. Um, the, the South Camp had the list of platforms here, these round platforms, the so-called Three Brethren, facing the, the hill fort uh, on the south side, and on the north side, um, this unusual elongated camp covering this one north gateway of the hill fort. But in fact, that was not how the story ultimately played out in the 60s and 70s. George Joby, the well-respected uh, archeologist of, the, of Iron Age sites in the borderlands, um, decided that this actually was more likely to be the site of a Roman training camp. Um, this was based on a theory put forward by Kenneth Steer at the time, who had suggested that the Romans um, would want to practice artillery, and this was an ideal position uh, for it to be, to be uh, practiced. Now, some of that was based on the material that was found on the hill top. There were ballista balls and sling bullets found uh, on the hill. But what Joby confirmed was that the original stone rampart that encircled the whole hill was down at the time that the missile barrage had taken place. So he reasoned that the Romans had built um, targets at the old hill fort gateways and that they were actually aiming at these targets. So he excavated uh, at the gateways to see if he could find more ballistic material, which he did do. Um, but it's worth pointing out at this point that you really only excavated at the gateways. And this was how it was subsequently seen. This is how it got into the popular literature at the time that somehow Burnwork had become uh, a Roman um, firing range, a sort of ancient Benbecula, where you've got um, a sort of missile firing range um, with the Roman soldiers lined up here, um, delivering missiles onto the top of the hill, and then checking how accurate that the practice has been. And that's the way it stood um, in the literature until about the 1990s, and then people were just not comfortable about that. And two people, Duncan Campbell and Lawrence Kepi, both published papers to suggest that this actually was the site of conflict. But the problem was, how do you prove that? How do you prove um, a, a situation where effectively you've got a film set, where everything that you see on that film set is the result of the Romans just pretending to assault the hilltop? And how do you decide whether it actually was a real event? That is not a, not a, a, a film set, but a, a site of actual conflict. So the for and against for this broke down into two main groups. There were issues that supported for a siege and those that supported the theory of a training camp. And you could virtually take the same data and slice it and dice it and move it from one column to the other because it seemed to support one view uh, or the other point of view. So there was a stalemate, if you like, and there was an archeological debate that rolled on um, until we decided to take an interest. Um, 
I met with Andy, and Andy came up with um, a research design for a bit of work that we were going to do, um, which took place in 2015, and we've got more work rolling on this year, and I'll talk about that in a second. But we, we put together a collaboration between the Trimontium Trust, the Fries and Galloway Council, and the National Lottery, and they gave us a, a, a grant to allow us to do the field work last year and this year. Um, and that was based on some novel um, ideas. And our objective was to get more data. That we felt that we were just, the same data was just going round and round in the, in the washing machine of, of archaeological theory. And that we needed to actually punch through that and get some more information. So we decided we're going to reassess the camp morphology because we thought that there'd been a lot taken for granted there that we needed to reassess. We needed to do a, an almost forensic ballistic analysis to look at the material that was found on the hilltop and to look at some of the experimental archaeology that we could do with that to see whether we could um, gain some more information about the, uh, about the slingshot particularly, and then look at the projectile scatter. That is, borrow some uh, uh, some theoretical frameworks from battlefield archaeology and approach the site as if it was a battlefield. And largely that would depend on metal detector survey because the lead missiles <coughs> gave us the opportunity to look at the site the way you could look at a site that had, uh, that had been a more modern scene of warfare. So, first of all, um, Let's take the assumption, were these siege camps? Because this has been one of the debates. Um, was this a siege or was it not a siege? Um, that depends on how you see these two camps. Did the Romans place them there to starve out and threaten the people on the hilltop? Or are they actually assault camps? Were they put there for a very brief period only to allow shelter, as the Romans did do, the, the Romans always ensured shelter for their men, um, security for their men, prior to uh, an event um, such as a major assault. So were they very temporary assault camps or not? And looking at the wider picture of Roman siege practice or assault practice, um, Duncan Campbell, who is an expert in Roman sieges, pointed out that the ideal scenario for a Roman commander was for a brief, frontal, full-on bloody assault. So the, the, the Romans would invest the, the hill fort that they were trying to take, but then have a very rapid assault. And they would avoid, if possible, a sort of situation where you starve out the people on the, the hilltop, because that exposes your men to a prolonged siege where they are encamped and then you've got the problems with disease, counterattack, and so on. So were we looking at something akin to Caesar's assault on Corfinium in Italy? So also the camp morphology. If you look at the shapes of these camps, it had always been assumed that they were practice camps because they're very irregular. They're not classically, perfectly shaped uh, Roman playing card shapes. And it had always been assumed that, in fact, and they were so gormless, these Roman troops, that they couldn't actually join this bit of rampart to this bit of rampart. Now, there's an internal contradiction in that. If you have the greatest military force in the ancient world, can't draw a straight line. There is a bit of a problem with the, 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 the theory. But that was the theory, that these camps were so irregular um, because they represented um, troops who were just unskilled. Um, but in fact, again, if you look at siege camps in other parts of the, the Roman world, the siege camps are very often irregular. And the reason for that is that they, they, they don't worry about getting their line straight. What they do is they utilize the land as carefully as possible um, and take the best tactical advantage from the land. So very often siege camps from other sites that are attested as sieges are irregular in shape. The other thing is that the, the Arkham's map makes the ramparts and the ditches look symmetrical. 
but in fact they're not symmetrical. And if you look at them more carefully, the ditches that face up the hill are very different from the ditches that are away from the hill. So here's the hill facing ditch of the south camp, and there's the ditch of uh, the, the, uh, the, the ditch to the south side that faces away from the hill. And similarly on the north camp, you can see that the ditch that faces the hill is completely <coughs> different in magnitude from the ditch that faces away. So you get a real sense that these ditches are proportionate to a perceived threat on the hilltop. Furthermore, the gateways in the south camp are huge. You can get 20 people out abreast from each of the gateways. And these are some of our volunteers. I see Peter and Brenda Dreghorn there in the middle, there in the audience um, this morning. Uh, the gateway itself, this is the smallest of the three gateways. The middle gateway is even larger. So you get the sense again that whoever was commanding this group wanted their men out as fast as possible up the hill the way you would if there was an assault. So we did some, um, some fancy photogrammetry. And this is built on a three-dimensional model. Um, our previous speakers have talked about this, this uh, technology. It's, it's actually relatively simple to use and relatively cheap. You can build a three-dimensional model using aerial photographs. And you can see that the best place to assault this hilltop is directly from the south. So we'll come back to that in a second. We looked at the sling bullet uh, ballistics. I'll just move this a bit closer, actually. There we go. Now, I mentioned this in the previous talk, that there are two ways of slinging uh, sling bullets. You can do a high lob that gives you a great distance of 300 meters or so. Um, but a much more accurate and deadly approach is a horizontal uh, approach. Um, so the slinger slings in a much flatter trajectory and is very accurate at about 100 to 120 meters. And that's exactly the distance from the, from the front rampart of the south camp to the front rampart of the uh, hill fort. So we also looked at the morphology of the shot, and we found that we had um, some help from a German colleague who had done some ballistic uh, work on the stopping power of a, of a manually fired sling. Um, and we showed that it was just short, the, the 50 gram slingshot was just short of a, a 44 Magnum bullet. We went to the Rosgush Museum and uh, so the National Museum of Scotland and asked to see all of their sling bullets that were in captivity. The, there were 54 from Burns' work in Edinburgh and there were another 53 in the Dumfries Museum. So we examined all of these, we re-examined them, we weighed them and we looked at the morphology and we discovered something that hadn't been observed before and that is that there's not just the lemon-shaped bullets that everybody knew the Romans used, or these quaint acorn-shaped ones that are unique to the Burns Warwick area. There was a third type. And the third type were smaller. They were about half the weight. And they had holes in them. And each one of these smaller bullets has got a five millimeter diameter hole. The holes are all exactly the same diameter and about five millimeters to eight millimeters deep. We wondered what these, uh, what these were, these holes. We had postulated potentially that they contained poison because there has been some suggestion that the Romans uh, poisoned their missiles. And we've got some chromatography going at the moment to, to examine the material um, that was found in a couple of the, the plugs. But the real reason for these, we think, came out of our ballistic experiments. And what we did was we cast several hundred of these sling bullets, and we made half of them with holes and half of them without. And we got uh, an expert slinger to uh, reconstruct some Iron Age slings um, based on uh, modern sling um, 
patterns from the Balearic slingers and also from the Apache Indians who still do uh, quite a bit of slinging. And we tested out the ballistics on a range. We, we made a range that looks like a Quidditch target. And we recorded these with a high-speed camera. And we found some interesting facts. Firstly, you can't find these again. We painted them day glow orange to try and assist finding them. You can't find them again. So these were not designed to be retrieved. So, so we're not looking at the Romans firing lead up, or sorry, Andy, <laughs> Andy was correct, but you can't fire a sling, you shoot a sling. <laughs> Shooting slings up a hill, I'll get it right one of these days. Um, shoot a sling up the hill to get the slings back. That's not what these were designed for. Secondly, there was a tendency to drop them. When the slinger was under pressure, he would drop about every tenth, um, every tenth sling balloon. And this is a picture from the, uh, this is a, a photograph of the excavation at the Little Bighorn battle site where they found that cavalry officers were dropping bullets unfired, about one in 10. So it seems that trembling hands under pressure drop ammunition um, at their feet. So that gave us an opportunity to try and identify where the Roman slingers were actually standing. So we also discovered that there was no difference between the acorn and lemon-shaped ones in flight. The, the little ones with the holes were ballistically inferior, but they had um, two attractions. One is that they could be fired in multiples up to five at a time, as a sort of form of um, Iron Age grape shot. And finally, the hole made them whistle. Uh, it gave them an aerophonic quality. And so you could hear these things coming where you couldn't hear the normal sling bullets coming. And these are the sound files. These are the sling bullets without holes, and these are the sling bullets with holes. And if you look at the ballistic scatter, this is the little bighorn. If you look at the ballistic scatter, um, our idea was not to retrieve all the finds. We were just going to um, identify where the uh, sling bullets were uh, found by the metal detector and then record the absolute figure uh, of the, the detector reading, which um, gives fairly accurate data on where lead was as opposed to copper, iron, and any other metal. You can see that shotgun cartridges come in at 52, lead bullets coming in at 82 as an absolute figure, and copper alloy coming in at 92. And the first metal detector survey, the reconnaissance survey we did in 2013, we showed that there was a peak of lead on the hilltop, and that we postulated that these were actually sling bullets. So we asked uh, Derek and Sharon from Beyond the Beep to uh, help us out, which they did um, in some pretty appalling weather. Um, it was during the storms that took place uh, at that period in the borders, and come hail or shine, these guys went out, and they did a sterling job. And the same storm flattened the shelter tents that we'd put up, so we were, we were literally driven from the hill over the course of about three days. But we persisted and the sun came out. This is Andy here laying out the first of the trenches. We, we hand dug two trenches. All these arrows that you see here are marking um, what we said were sling bullets. And these are the two trench sites, one across the ramparts and another one um, towards the saddle of the hill. And this is the turf coming off, and you can see how shallow the, the, the soil is here. Here's the tumbled rampart, and the, the, um, the bullet markers are still in the ground. Um, we made lots of finds. Kay was kept very busy with our, our, our finds. Um, a very brief digression, we found some other ammunition. These are 
um, mortars from the Second World War. We didn't expect to find these. Um, and these had to be um, blown up by the bomb squad who came and stopped our work for one afternoon um, and made sure that everybody was safe um, by getting rid of some modern ammunition. So back to the ancient ammunition, and you can see how accurate the detector signals are. Here's one of the sticks here, and you can see as we excavate away, you can see the sling bullet appearing. Um, there's another one. The lead oxide is very dark, and you can see how the, a lot of the lead was flung out with the earlier excavation. We found uh, the correct ratio of acorns to lemons, as had been found by the Jobe excavation, so that was good to confirm that that was still the case. And we found smaller sling bullets, as we had again predicted from the material from the National Museum, and every one of these had a hole in it. And there's the comparison between the standard lemon shape and the ones with the holes. We've also had lead analysis done to try and find out where the lead uh, has come from. And our colleagues um, from uh, Germany, from Frankfurt, have done the lead analysis for us. And that's been done by selecting bullets that were um, held by the National Museum and Dumfries, and also looking at some similar bullets from Carlisle and also from Housesteads. There's one acorn shaped sling bullet from Housesteads. So these were um, biopsied um, by uh, my, my German colleagues and myself. These are three sling bullets from Birrens. They're the only acorn shaped sling bullets in a group to be found on a Roman fort anywhere in Britain. And they come from Birrens, which is just two and a half miles down the road. And these were sent off for analysis. That's the one from Housesteads. And the Burnswort group, these are German sling bullets and German ores. There's bullets from Haltern, Kalkrise, and so on. But the Burnswort ones lie in this group. And if you expand the group, this is the scatter of bullets that we biopsied, but the Burnswort bullets all lie very, very tight in this group of, of uh, lead alloy. And in fact, the acorn-shaped ones are all within that group, including the Birrens uh, three. So the acorn-shaped one from Housesteads, the three from Birrens, and all the ones from Burnswort are the same isotope, the same lead. So they're temporarily related. It wasn't just, uh, it wasn't just bullets that we found. Uh, we found blister balls. And these were actually embedded in the rampart. Um, we found a carved stone sling bullet as well. And this is the sort of array of material that was coming out. And just to show that we were complete in our Roman missiles, we found an iron point that's probably uh, an iron scorpion arrowhead, ballista arrowhead as well. That was found on the last day. They always say you find the best stuff on the last day. Um, to show the density of material coming out of this site, this is what came out of this one trench. This is a single trench that Andy has selected across that half kilometer of hill front. Um, all of that material came out of one trench. So what did we find in total? Well over 2,000 targets over the course of the 10 days. Just under 700 are probably slingshot. This is the distribution across the site. Here's the hill fort here, and you can see the pink is the lead. This is lead. And you can see that there's a drop area here behind the uh, front rampart of the south camp. There are some, unexpectedly, we found some lead bullets in the north camp as well. There's a funny cluster here, but the vast majority spread over half a kilometer along the front. This is where George Joby predicted that the Roman targets were. So that's where he dug and that's where he found the sling bullets. But the reality is that they extend over a much wider area. And in fact, the densities all around this 
um, western end of the hill are quite striking. So the theory of the um, shooting at the three camp gateways um, doesn't really stand to, uh, to the test of the archaeology. The eastern gateway doesn't exist and the other two uh, gateways are not the sole point of activity. We think that there's been a frontal barrage and another smaller barrage towards the north gate. And this is our proposed choreography of what we think happened, that there was a principal line of assault from the south towards this rampart with the Roman military getting up onto the hilltop and then turning to the west. And we've only detected about a third of the summit on the west side because of the grass there. And we think that this may represent an attempted escape route from the north. So in conclusion, we feel so far, and as we would like to stress, this is still a work in progress. The morphology of the camps represent the tactical response to the terrain, not to um, cack-handedness of the, of the Roman troops. We believe that the projectile barrage is over at least half a kilometre, and not just at the gateways. The missile fabric suggests that they were designed to kill and to also intimidate. The barrage was compatible with suppressive fire before an assault. There's a speculative area about why the magnitude of this assault, when did it happen and why, and it's got implications for slinging studies. So what now? Andy has just put together another research design for, for this year. We're going to assess the relationship of the sling bullets to the ramparts themselves of the Roman camps and to look for dating evidence and we've got a whole pile of other um, work to do on chromatography and metallurgy of the sling bullets. And finally, there's a rampart here around the western hill, uh, the, the western plateau, that has never been tested properly by archaeology. We don't know the relationship of it to the assault. We know that the old rampart was down, but we have no idea what that temporal relationship of that turf rampart was. And just as a final last gasp, these are the Birins three being found from some original work. And um, so this was Anne Robertson's dig from Birins from the 1970s. And these are the three lead sling bullets found in 1976. And it's those three that we've biopsied. Um, and we have shown that they're related. They are the, the brothers and sisters of the ones on the hilltop. So thank you very much for your patience and we hope to perhaps bring you some more information next year. Thank you.